and welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is Friday, September 3rd, 2021. Coming to you early with John Rabino because of the Monday holiday. And John, there is, I think it's time for Biden to declare a national emergency. Um, oh, but first, uh, email us with your questions, comments, put them on YouTube. We love getting them. Uh, KL at KerryLutz.com. But getting back to that emergency, John, I mean, and I think, I think really the FDA, the FTC has gotten involved in it. I think it needs to be escalated because it's up there with Afghanistan. And that is there is a chronic uh, shortage or breakage of McDonald's shake machines. And nobody seems to be able to fix this and it's causing a lot of angst across the country. It's up there, probably a national priority is up there with Afghanistan, John. Hey, Kerry. Well, you know, it's part of a bigger theme, right? We're not good at stuff anymore. Um, we, you know, we, we can't extricate ourselves from occupations of other countries and we can't make milkshakes at McDonald's along with a lot of other stuff, right? You know, there's no cars on car lots anymore because um, we somehow can't get a hold of the computer chips that you need to make cars. It just goes on and on. Um, and, you know, I, I might be repeating myself on, on your show by saying this is like the 1970s all over again, but it is starting to be that way because um, back in the 1970s, that was our last big currency crisis in the U.S. And, and several things were happening. One is that uh, we just had a you know, chaotic retreat from the Vietnam War, which is a, a lot like, visually, a lot like the Afghanistan thing, where we're trying to take off on, and fly away, and people are holding on to the vehicles and falling off and everything. And, um, and we weren't very good at making cars back then. The Japanese car makers were coming in and just eating GMs and, and Ford's lunch. So we didn't really necessarily think we were good at manufacturing stuff anymore. Um, and we were borrowing too much money and printing too much currency and the dollar was going down and inflation was going up. So it's, it's very similar to what's happening almost across the board here right now where we've got, you know, employment um, disappointing, you know, the jobs number came out today and it was really, really disappointing. And um, all the big investment banks and, and Fed offices are, are starting to scale back their GDP projections for the year ahead dramatically, you know, from 8% to 3% 3, 3 growth is, is kind of how these projections are being scaled back. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's kind of an across the board loss of perception of confidence and, uh, and, sense that we have control over our own destiny that's happening right now. And in a fiat currency system, that can be deadly because um, a, a fiat currency like the dollar or the euro or, or the yen only exists, only have value because we trust the people who are in charge of it. And as soon as we lose trust in those people, then we, by definition, lose trust in that currency. Uh, and that was what happened in the 1970s. The dollar just fell off the table and inflation spiked to double digits. And to get out of it, we had to raise interest rates to um, 14, 16, 18 percent, depending on the interest rate. And um, we could never do that now. So we don't have the tool to fix a replay of the 1970s. And yet we seem to be heading into a situation that's very similar, both numerically and psychologically to the 1970s. So that's a very scary prospect if that's what's happening. Hey, and back then, don't forget, the country economically was a lot stronger. The industrial base was in place. We had way, way less de debt, like we had a trillion dollars worth of debt or something. I mean, it was like nothing. Our national debt was like a rounding error. And honestly, John, if we uh, get stagflation, we should consider ourselves very fortunate because things are so much different now. And you could always buy a car even back in the 1970s. It wasn't a car that you particularly wanted. It was going to fall apart after 20,000 miles. Uh, they are much better now. Now they last at least till the end of the warranty, American cars. Um, and you can get extended warranties. But uh, pretty much everybody's cars are made of plastic. Uh, well, we do have the leading 
auto brand now or soon to be the leading auto brand. And I'm talking about Tesla. So that's what's interesting. Maybe technology bailed us out in the uh, in the 90s, uh, the internet and all that. What is going to bail us out now unless we have like, uh, I don't know, supersonic or aerospace planes so you can uh, live in New York City and commute to Tokyo for work? Uh, I don't know. I don't see the trend that will bail out the country and the world. Is there a trend out there? Like the internet really bailed out the world in the 90s and early 2000s, but that's just part of the fabric now. Is there something like the internet that can really bail the world out this time, John? Well, there are all kinds of amazing new technologies coming along. Um, but, but I think that's a separate thing from the fact that we're blowing up our lives financially because you know, you can have solar panels take over the, uh, the energy economy or, you know, biotech um, give us all kinds of things that we didn't have last year. But those things can happen and we can still go broke. And I, I kind of think that finance will swamp technology in the short run just because the financial mistakes we're making are so much bigger than the early impact of technological change. Um, and, and as you said, um, stagflation might be the best case scenario. And, and really, if we just have a replay of the 1970s, that would be a miracle <laughs> because we're in so much worse shape than we were back then. We cannot use the same tools to fix these problems that we used back then, which means that we probably don't have any tools left. You know, there's nothing we can do to stop a, uh, a waterfall decline of the major currencies once people lose faith in them. There's no way to raise interest rates to a level that would stop the decline in the dollar. In other words, make dollar denominated bonds more attractive because the bonds yield more without blowing up the leverage speculating community, which is to say basically everybody right now, you know, from homeowners to college students, um, to consumers, to corporations, we're all leverage speculators now. We're all borrowing huge amounts of money to place one kind of a bet or another on something paying off. And by and large, those things are not going to pay off, <laughs> at least on, on a scale that will allow us to pay off our debts. Um, so you raise the interest rate that we have to pay on the loans that we took out to make these bets, and we all go bankrupt. And, and that's kind of what would be, we would be looking at if we used 1970s tools to fix 1970s style problems this year. So I don't know what the answer is. You know, some kind of really cathartic period of chaos in which we, uh, you know, have a come to Jesus moment and get our act together is what has to happen in the optimistic scenario, but it won't be pleasant. It won't be, um, you know, a few years of um, rocky times like in the uh, early 1980s when we have a hard recession and then we kind of get back to normal. Nothing like that is even remotely possible this time around. Definitely not. And I sent you that chart, which I hadn't looked at up until yesterday of commodity prices. And uh, let's face it, commodity prices, commodities are main input into finished goods. And looking at them, it was staggering. The commodity price index, that's everything. I don't know if it's weighted or unweighted, is uh, 61%. Now, one good thing is commodity beverage price index, which I hope includes hard liquor, that's only up 18%. So at least, at least when it comes to uh, buying uh, liquid uh, relief from all these price increases, you're not doing so badly. But but some of the prices on here, like crude oil, up seventy one percent. Nat gas up one hundred eighteen percent. Propane one hundred twenty two. I mean, these are staggering numbers. Russian nat gas, which just spiked a couple of weeks ago uh, to all time highs, five hundred ninety five percent. But if uh, you know chocolate for your chocolate bar, that's only up eleven percent. But coffee bad up 38 and a half percent you know you look at all this stuff john it's like across the board and this doesn't even include like lumber the only commodities that aren't up are the precious metals with the exception of palladium but uh, gold silver and platinum and such are just uh, they're in the doghouse 
they haven't hardly gone up. Copper is way up. That's not on the list here. But uh, but for the most part, precious metals have been omitted. And I'm saying now that uh, today we had a really good run up, 20 bucks in uh, gold prices and almost a dollar on silver. But it seems to me that they are the next commodity to uh, to see the results of stagflation. Okay, two things about that, that table that uh, have all the commodity price increases there. Um, if, if all of that stuff is up by big double digit, digit rates in the last year, how can we only have 4% inflation? You know, what, that means a bunch of things have to be going down commensurately, right? To bring us back to close to zero. And I don't know if anything going down is, you know, is medical care going down or college tuition? Car prices aren't going down, they're way up. So um, it, that chart implies that governments are lying about inflation right now. Oh. In order, they, <laughs> surprise, surprise. No, they <laughs> never do that, John. Did they ever do that, really? Yeah, you're Imagine right. Imagine a government I lying. I shouldn't have insulted all those good people. <laughs> but um, it, the other thing that it means, which, which you just spelled out, is that gold and silver are the outliers and either all of the rest of the commodity complex comes back down or gold and silver catch up. And I, I think it's highly likely that in the next few years, gold and silver will catch up to the, the current increases in the other commodities. In other words, gold will go up as much as iron ore, which is up, what, 150 or 200% in, in the last couple of years. I know that because we're putting in a chain link fence <laughs> and all the, all the guys who've come out to make estimates are, are, are like, oh yeah, you know, this is going to cost twice as much as it would have last year because chain link fences are made out of steel and still, you know, iron ore is way up. So that's a painful reality to me right now of the impact of inflation. And, and I think lots of other people are feeling their own versions of that same pain when they go out and try to buy something big and find out that they, they can't have it for what they used to think of as a reasonable price. Uh, so the psychological impact of rising inflation can't be far from the surface now. You know, it's, it's gotta be bubbling up for a lot of people who are starting to get more and more concerned about the future because they know they're going to have to buy some things in the future, right? And now they're starting to think, oh my God, uh, do I have the money to buy this thing two years from now? Should I buy it right now, even though it's way up? Uh, which is the kind of inflationary mindset that sets in and really sends prices rocketing when you just, you know, you don't care what it costs today because you think it's going to be way more than that no matter what tomorrow. So you buy whatever you have to buy immediately. In other words, you dump your currency for real things. And we can't be far from that based on what commodities are doing and what a lot of real world products are doing. So, uh, and, and that bleeds over into your investment um, mindset. When everything you're trying to buy that you need for your life is going way up, you start to wonder about inflation in general and you start to look around for things that you can invest in that will go up. And gold and silver, as the things that have not gone up yet, but normally do go up in this kind of an environment, look better than ever right now. You know, silver at 25 bucks an ounce, I think we'll look back on that and go, oh my God, could you, could I have actually bought silver at 25 bucks? Oh, why didn't I? Why didn't I mortgage the house? <laughs> and um, I'm not saying mortgage your house and buy silver, but we're going to look back on it and think with, with hindsight that we should have mortgaged our house. Hey, well, John, after listening to you, um, you know, I bought this house, it's in great shape, but uh, the appliances are looking a little bit worn. I mean, I was just saying, well, you know, I could get, I could get another five years out of the microwave, out of the oven. The fridge is pretty good. But after listening to you, I just think I'm going to go out and buy all new appliances. Because <laughs> what is the point of if, if I wait, if I wait two years, they'll probably be double what they are now. I might as well just get them while I can. And the question is, will we export inflation to the rest of the world? You know, you and I had this discussion when the stimulus spigot was opened uh, wide open, that there was going to be consumer price inflation. And we have to like dif differentiate because we're Austrians and, and the definition of inflation is expansion of the money supply. But we expanded the money supply, doubled, tripled it, 
and we didn't uh, the amount of goods being produced were uh, was declined uh, was cut dramatically by the lockdowns and now we're reaping we're reaping our rewards for the stupidity the idiocy of the policies of uh, the past couple of years actually for the past 60 70 years but it's all coming home to roost now and like you said i don't see any way out of it well uh, we, we need to make sure we don't make this just an american thing too because yeah yeah we could be exporting inflation except that the whole rest of the world is making these same mistakes so it's not like there's anybody out there that's in a deflationary spiral that uh, that we can affect with our rising prices here you know commodities are a global market so when they go up in dollar terms they go up in euro and yen and pound sterling terms too so everybody is experiencing this same inflation more or less because they're all making the same mistakes so when this thing really gets going it's not like there's going to be a lot of places to hide out there i mean well the commodity countries the ones that produce these commodities, like for instance, Canada, will, yeah. will tend to do better than the commodity consuming countries. But you know, it's gonna be inflation for everybody if these trends continue. And, and that is to say, it's gonna be a currency crisis for everybody. All the currencies of the world will start to decline at an accelerating rate. And you know what's funny about this is that it's completely possible that while that's going on, the media is going to be touting the dollar as the strong currency because it's up 12% uh -huh. against the uh, euro in the last year. But what they won't mention is that the euro fell by 45% and the, uh, the dollar only fell by 30%. <laughs> so it's strong relative to the euro. Uh, but actually, the, all the big currencies are falling in value against real stuff, which is purchasing power. That's the... Uh, that's the way you measure a currency. And in terms of purchasing power, you already um, showed that um, the dollar is plunging against most major commodities, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. So, you know, we're seeing raging inflation right now. In other words, a raging drop in the value of the dollar and the other big currencies. And it's hidden by the fact that we measure those currencies against each other. So they can all fall and still be relatively stable in the mind of the mainstream media and the economics profession. You know, it's like a bunch of guys going to the bar, tying one over and then uh, getting, a, getting it to go because you can do that now since we had a certain health ailment, you're allowed to get your adult beverages to go from many places around the country and then hopping into their supercars and deciding they're going to do a cross-country race. And uh, man, the results uh, of such behavior cannot be good. And it's going to be a disaster. It's The disaster is already shaping up. Uh, but if you watch the mainstream media, John, everything's great. Man, economic growth is great. Employment number as well, not as good as we thought, but but everything's good. Hey, American military might still intact, even though we had a couple of minor setbacks in the Middle East and uh, Afghanistan, but everything's good. So they're leading us, they're whistling past the cemetery, literally leading us and so many of you out there to oblivion because they're lulling you into a false sense of security. So you're not taking the measures necessary that you otherwise might if you were seeing reality clearly, not through the uh, warped, distorted lens of modern mass media. Well, the, the state media, which is what most of the big um, media outlets are now, they're just like the government's, you know, fifth branch of the government now. And, and they're going to be the last ones that recognize reality as it emerges out there, because it's in their interest to hide that reality. I mean, if, if negative things are happening in the world and you've got a fiat currency to protect, then you have to spin it in ways that um, will make people less worried than they would be if you were telling the truth, because your job is to prop up the currency and to prop up the legitimacy of the government in general. So they will never tell the truth um until well they you know they they attempted to tell the negative side of the story when trump was in power because he was seen as 
uh, the enemy of the deep state. And um, now they're back to what they consider to be normal and they, they have to lie in the other direction now and tell us things are actually better than, uh, than they really are. Uh, so we have to seek out unbiased sources of information and then make our own decisions basically. And, and you know, there's a, a lot of that out there. A lot of um, really good reporters have been so, become so disgusted by their jobs in mainstream media that they're leaving for places like Substack where, you know, Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald are out there telling the what? unfiltered truth. And you know, that's available. You can sign up for either of their Substack feed, along with a lot of other strong reporters, strong, honest reporters, Substack feeds and YouTube channels and stuff like that, and, and get a big part of the truth. And that's what we should all be doing. We should be seeking out um, sources of information who don't have a built-in bias because they're, they're not being paid by some big corporation to, uh, to spin stories. Uh, in ways that are favorable for the corporation, you know, and, and we can do that. It's all out there. So at least until it, it becomes censored to oblivion, but right now it's available. You know, you have to look for it a little bit, but you can find it. Yeah. And, you know, shows like yours, Carrie, uh, people can subscribe to your feeds and get a really um, varied take on what's going on in the world most of which is from people who don't have any kind of a conflict of interest. You know, they're just telling the truth as they see it. Uh, and that, that's very useful. I mean, it's terrifying yeah. <laughs> compared to what the, the mainstream media are telling you. But, it, you know, sometimes painful truths are, um, are much better than fantasy. And this is one of those times. Maybe I'll stop uh, watching my own uh, content and just switch to the mainstream media because it just makes you feel so much better. Everything is good. You know, what are you worrying about? You know, the Alfred E. Newman uh, outlook. What, me worry? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, what, Jay Powell worry? Uh, destroying the currency? What's the problem? No problem here. Nothing to see here, John. Just move along because we know that, uh, that everything is going to work out in the end. Uh, you know, Will Rogers always used to say, ignorance got us into this mess and ignorance will get us out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can hope. Yeah. <laughs> the ignorance definitely got us into the mess. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, and uh, hey, I don't think ignorance is a uh, strategy for the prosperous tomorrow. But, uh, but as long as we keep electing the same morons, and we really have no choice because it's moron A or moron B, and you could just ignore his party. You know, one thing we need to talk about, though, John, is the recall effort underway in California to remove uh, Gavin Newsom, or they call him Gavin Gruesome, or Gavin Nuisance. I mean, when it comes to lockdowns, I mean, really, nobody's got anything on this guy. Uh, we can't talk about, uh, about the science behind it or anything else, because we're not allowed. But the point is, he, he has a very serious threat of being recalled. And the reason I know it is Soros sent him another million uh, for his efforts, and the, the uh, polling has reached the gaslight phase. Like they're saying that 58% of the people don't want to get rid of Newsom. And we know that they're really unhappy in, Cal in California, as, uh, as Schwarzenegger would say. The last time they did something like this was back, I think, in 2003, when they recalled uh, Gray Davis and they installed an actor in the... Uh, in Sacramento, uh, this is a major thing because if Larry Elder becomes governor of California, then it's all over here because this guy's a libertarian and he seems to like have a vision and he seems to like uh, really want to shake things up. So I don't see where they can allow him to. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how votes are counted in uh, California. Uh, he's a long shot, but can you imagine a dark horse candidate? No, no aspersions on him. Uh, can you imagine if he gets elected, John? Um, yeah, that would be a, a pretty chaotic outcome, in, in part because um, it, it doesn't change the makeup of California's state legislature, which is, I think, supermajority Democrat, right? So you would basically have 
really loud gridlock because <laughs> Larry Elder wouldn't be silent about uh, all of his ideas being blocked by the legislature. Um, and the legislature wouldn't be uh, silent about the crazy guy in, in the governor's mansion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and <sighs> California is so badly run right now that either they change a lot of their governing principles or people vote with their feet and um, sell their California houses and move to Idaho or Montana or Texas or Florida, and the state starts emptying out. So that's their choice, you know, and that's the nice thing about states. They're, they're not monopolies. People can still vote to leave and in that way pass judgment on government policies at the state level. And I, I think right now it's obvious that um, California's policies aren't working. And a growing number of people are just throwing up their hands and leaving. You know, I had some friends from California come stay with us for a couple of days a while back, and they just told horror stories and, you know, showed me some videos of driving by, um, for instance, a, um, a jogging trail, a bike trail, where it's for like a mile, just tents. You know, it's, it's turned into a homeless <laughs> encampment, this trail that they used to hike on, and now they're terrified to go there. Um, and if you at the state level or at the city level, how, where, wherever it's supposed to be addressed, if you can't address something like that, there's going to be regime change. Um, and whether it's chaotic or smooth is, um, is kind of irrelevant to the actual regime change. It's going to happen. You know, they're, you're going to throw you out and they're going to put somebody else in charge and then we'll just see what happens. And that's where California is right now. You know, it, even if... Um, the recall election fails and uh, the current governor stays in power, um, there will still be kind of a changing of the guard in terms of who's in charge just because um, it got so close. You know, they, they almost threw the governors out or the governor out. And that means everybody else has to start paying attention. But it's not clear what lessons they'll take from that. You know, what kind of attention they're supposed to be paying and what they're supposed to do. It, it could be that um, they go further in the other direction, assuming that they just haven't gone far enough and doubling down on their existing policies will fix things. You know, that's that's completely possible in the mind of, of people <laughs> at that level of politics. So we'll see. You know, okay. I, I think chaos is the only, here again, chaos is the only thing you can predict with any kind of certainty. I just can't fathom things getting worse there. Like, uh, well, we don't have enough homeless. We, we need more policies to encourage the homeless. I mean, these people who are ill, mentally ill, drug addicted, alcoholic, uh, whatever, they need to be institutionalized. But that's a story for another day. But keep your eye on California. The recall election is just 11 days away, September 14th. It's the only thing on the ballot. Uh, even if the polls are true that 58% to a 58% of the uh, voting population or the likely voters want to keep Gavin Newsom in they don't really know what a likely voter is because uh, how many people are really going to the polls and his opponents could no doubt have a much higher enthusiasm rate than his supporters and and we've seen what happens when that happens. So just be prepared. There could very well be an upset. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying it is a possibility. Hey, in any event, make sure you go over to dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for John's newsletter. It's definitely worth your while because you will get the truth, uh, the whole truth, and all the truth you can stomach. That's a promise. And same with us, Financial Survival Network. Subscribe. John. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Have a great holiday. Thanks, Gary. You too.